Uh, I'm going to use my 15 minutes here to talk about organizing strength training to support rowing training and performance. So we're going to start at the seasonal level with which physical qualities we focus on during which phase of our rowing training, then go to the weekly level and discuss scheduling strength training based on what's going on in the rowing training, uh, and then end at the daily level with managing strength and rowing training within a single day or within a single training session. So let's start with the big picture first and look at all of the different physical training factors that influence rowing performance. So obviously we know the technique is a big factor uh, in, in rowing performance. Uh, movement qualities, you've just heard from Blake is a big one. Aerobic fitness, if we're doing a 2K, we're getting about 80 to 90% of our uh, energy from the aerobic system. So we've got to have great aerobic endurance. Uh, just like Dr. Steven Seiler said in his keynote, anaerobic capacity is a much greater determinant for 1K and 2K rowers than in other endurance sports. So we've got to have good anaerobic fitness to power our starts, sprints, uh, power tens. Um, and then again, because of the external resistance of water and the slower stroke time, we need strength. We need power so that that strength is delivered quickly to the handle, to the blade. Uh, and then we need muscle mass. So rowing is a leverage sport. And as long as we have all of the other things to power our, our muscular system, having more muscle mass is generally going to be more helpful for rowing performance. So the big thing here is that this is way too much to train everything in one single season. So we've got to have some way of breaking this down across our whole year of training uh, so that we can prioritize and, and develop all these different factors that influence peak performance. And periodization is our answer there for what physical factors we prioritize at what point in the training year for rowers. And we could break each of these general phases down uh, for greater detail, but off-season, pre-season, and in-season uh, is, a, is a pretty good start just to look at how our training builds and changes over year to address all of our different physical factors. Because I only have 15 minutes, I can't go into details on uh, exact sets, reps, exercises for how we train each of these areas. But Blake, Joe, and I have all a lot of resources available online, uh, including the US Rowing daily webinars from, from earlier this year, uh, where we do talk about specific training methods. So for right now, we're just looking at the big picture um, and, and the or organizational level for how we fit all these different pieces in over a year of training. So let's add the rowing details in now, because this is obviously an important part. Uh, in the off season, we tend to be focused on longer aerobic uh, endurance on the rowing training. During that time, we're also gonna be doing strength training for body composition and basic strength. So body composition, by that I mean losing body fat or gaining muscle mass, depending on which one is going to be more impactful for the athlete's performance. And then strength takes the longest time to build out of all of our qualities. So we're going to spend a lot of our training time building that while we're in this phase of decreased rowing training and decreased performance needs so that we have the time and the recovery and the energy to make those changes in strength training. In the preseason, our rowing training starts to come up and we start training more uh, shorter duration, more power emphasis. In strength training, that's when we start to focus more on maximal strength and more on power. So we're supporting the rowing training goals as we get into our uh, closer to our peak performance. And Joe's going to talk about in season during his. So I'm not going to go into that much, except to say that obviously in rowing training, by that point, we're focusing on race performance. And in strength training, we are also focusing on race performance. So we're making sure that the athlete uh, is ready to go for, for whatever they need to do for rowing. So whether that's um, erg racing, seat selection, uh, seat racing, and then of course, actually getting to the race itself. It's important that we train during our in-season time to maintain all of the work that we did uh, through the off-season. Now, some rowers or coaches only have enough or only have contact time during one or two of these three seasons. And three to four months out of the year really isn't enough time to drive sufficient physical adaptation. So if you only have that one phase of these three, then I think any strength or land training time that you do have is probably best spent improving movement quality as Blake outlined. Um, if you have two seasons of strength training, then you can make some progress on the sort of two steps forward, one step back model, uh, because there's going to be that three to four month gap where we're not training and, and we're probably losing some of what we've built. Uh, obviously, the best case scenario is to have all three in some format to be able to build each season on the previous season, each year on the previous year, and then to make improvement over four years uh, for a high school or college rower or far beyond that for an elite or master's rower. 
And when I talk about having focus points for each season in our overall periodization scheme, we still have to dedicate some training time to maintaining our previously developed qualities. So this is a concept called vertical integration, which is a system of prioritizing key qualities, developing those qualities at strategic, strategic phases in the training cycle, uh, and then maintaining those qualities while developing others. So my graphic here demonstrates this management over an entire training year. Uh, our more fixed periodization structures develop during a time before year round training. So if we have summer camps uh, or, or performance events, fall head races, tryouts, winter erg racing, seat selection, and then of course, actual spring sprint racing, if we're on like the junior or collegiate schedule, we can't have these huge swings in our physical training focus uh, where we're going away from qualities 100% for months at a time. But we also know that we can't train to develop all of those qualities to peak performance simultaneously. So we've got to have some system of, okay, we're going to prioritize and develop this but we're also gonna be doing some training to maintain those so that we're not starting over each time. So on the bottom here, I've got my progression from off season to preseason to in season. And then the red line shows basically how much training time uh, focus or emphasis we're dedicating to that individual quality. So you'll note that none of these are ever zero because we're never going away from that training entirely. The one that we might is down at the bottom with boat feel, team fit, and race performance. If we're in the summer and we don't have those events coming up, then we really can go away from those. Um, but oftentimes athletes will still be doing some sort of rowing specific uh, training even in their off season so that we can maintain that while we focus on all the other things. So the exact amounts of this isn't super important. It's just the general idea that in the off season, we're going from an emphasis on general movement, body composition, and muscular strength. Then we're gradually tapering that down over the year as our emphasis on power, uh, fitness, both aerobic and anaerobic, as well as our rowing uh, specific metrics come up. So just wanted to introduce this as the idea for prioritizing some, developing those, maintaining others so that those qualities are still accessible when we need them later in the season. So that's the big picture of seasonal organization. And now let's look at the weekly level for how we can schedule strength training to support our rowing training. And this is basically the question of whether we're gonna consolidate and combine our high intensity sessions, or if we're going to distribute and separate our high intensity sessions. So this is an example of the two different approaches. Again, the exact breakdown of the sessions is not super important. What I'm using this to illustrate is that the athletes are doing the same volume but in the consolidated model, they're gonna double up their high intensity sessions where they're doing the higher intensity erg or row on their strength training day, then take the next two days for recovery and building aerobic endurance, then another double up day. In the distributed session, we go the other way. We use our erg training or our rowing time for low intensity, do our strength training, and we manage that recovery on a daily cycle. So <clears throat> there's pros and cons to both of these. Um, the consolidated schedule has greater daily variance in energy levels and fatigue levels. So the rowers are gonna be more fatigued on their high intensity double up days. And then we'll use the low intensity days for recovery and base work. Um, and in my experience, this can help with getting more volume into a week of training, but it does mean that athletes need to be able to manage the uh, higher fatigue swings. So we've got to have the rest of the athlete's lifestyle all dialed in to support their training. I think a little bit more than on the distributed design where we're balancing out that recovery over a whole week. So uh, the distributed design, I see it as being a little bit more helpful for getting more out of each individual training session. Um, and that might be helpful for athletes doing a lower training volume or focusing more on a higher intensity training so that we're, we're really balancing out those high intensity stressors with uh, you know 16 to 24 hours in between each one. There's no research uh, indicating greater efficacy one way or the other on this. And to me, that just means that uh, whatever rowers and coaches can choose the model that works best for their schedule, performance, and training style. So my hope here is that introducing you to these two different models can allow for some self-experimentation and figuring out which one really works best for you. So let's go now to the daily level. Uh, this is a question I get a lot with what is the best time to strength train when rowers are also doing rowing or erging training. Uh, and I'm thinking about two major things in my answer. The first one is fatigue spillover from training two modes of high intensity, full body exercise. When we row or erg, we fatigue the muscles of the legs, core, back, and shoulders. 
then when we do full body strength training with exercises like squats, deadlifts, pulls, and presses, we're calling on all those same muscle groups again. And this can simply be too much for the structures supporting these muscles. And we see athletes get uh, spine, rib, or shoulder injuries due to too much fatigue on the same areas of the body. So if the muscles are unable to support and transfer stroke force, it's going to go somewhere. And that leaves the skeletal structures and tendons and ligaments to pick up the slack. So muscles have high blood flow and recover quickly. Bones, ligaments, and tendons have very low blood flow uh, and a much slower recovery time from loading. So enough fatigue spillover over time, we start to see uh, injuries on these structures like low back pain and rib stress injuries, especially. So the other consideration is the interference effect between training for strength and training for aerobic endurance. So when people talk about cardio kills your gains or muscle mass making you slow, they're talking about the interference effect. And basically training for strength and training for endurance close together sends a conflicting physiological signal, which results in a diminished adaptation from training. Theoretically, we might be able to maximize pure endurance or pure power by only doing single mode training. So only endurance or only strength training and power training, but the strength, power, and endurance demands of rowing means that rowers must do concurrent training at some level because we're not doing a pure endurance sport. We're not doing a pure power sport. So we got to be able to manage both of these. Uh, and that means we need to be able to manage fatigue spillover from the two uh, full body and in high intensity modes of exercise, as well as the interference effect from concurrent training. In the ideal world, we simply train them apart from each other. So we do one mode in the morning, we rest, we hydrate, we eat, we move around for eight or so hours while we recover. And then we do another mode in the evening. And then again, hydrate, eat, get a good night's sleep, get up the next day and do it again. Research indicates very little interference when strength and endurance training are trained eight hours apart. However, uh, many rowers don't have such control over their schedule. So we can't always achieve this. We're often doubling up on a morning and a late morning or an early afternoon and a later evening. Uh, or maybe we only have one two hour block of time per day to get all of our training in. So there's inherently going to be some fatigue spillover and some interference between these two, which can impair performance and increase risk of injury. Now that's okay, because again, it's the less ideal world. It's still better than not doing either form of training, but we do need to have some good training strategies in place to be able to mitigate this. So here are a few uh, that are based on research in concurrent uh, sports. So other high intensity uh, blended aerobic endurance sports. Um, and the big one for me as a strength coach is strength training two to three times a week. If we do more than that, it's very hard to have enough recovery time and energy for hard rowing and erging. So if rowers are doing five, six days a week of rowing and erging training, even more than that, if we're going up to 10, 12, 14 sessions a week, we just can't add in more than two to three days a week of full body strength training two to three days a week is enough to be able to drive adaptation. So that's fine. Um, now this next one's going to be maybe a little bit counterintuitive and controversial, but if you have a choice strength train first and then row or erg after that. Now in his session, uh, Frank Clayton mentioned that of course there is going to be a negative performance effect on the erging or rowing after that. So if you've got a test, then you would want to not do strength training and focus on the erging or rowing. But if we're just doing training pieces, there's less interference and less fatigue spillover if we do our strength training first, have a short window, and then do our rowing or erging after that. And I think that's especially beneficial if going to point number three, we can use heart rate or blood lactate if that's available to you instead of split or watts. And you've heard a lot about that from Dr. Seiler today. So hopefully that's not going to be too hard of a sell. But the idea there is that uh, using heart rate or blood lactate is going to take that prior fatigue into account in a way that split or watts wouldn't. So if you're trying to hit a 145 for your split, that's going to be highly affected. That, that's a performance essentially, but your heart rate is going to be your heart rate, even if your legs are a little bit fatigued or if your core is a little bit tired. So there's less um, of, a, of an interference there if we can use a different way other than, other than split or watts. Um, back to the strength training side, my strength training is low volume. Um, I tend to not do stuff more than 15 or 20 reps unless we're working like minor supporting um, muscles and exercises. So if we're doing squats, deadlifts, pulls, presses, any of these compound exercises, we're pretty much staying in the three to 12 rep range. If we're training 
uh, higher rep muscular power and also aerobic power, then we get into that blended interference zone. So let's keep those apart if we're going to have to train close together in time. Uh, and then avoiding training to failure. So it's just, if there is fatigue spillover, training to failure is just an extra injury risk. Uh, and there's more recovery required from pushing to that, that full, full level. So let's wrap up our three organizational takeaways. Uh, big ones here, seasonal periodization plans so that we're working each quality over an overall year of training uh, with integration. So we're always doing, going back to the vertical integration chart, a little bit of work to maintain uh, each quality as we go. At the weekly level, there's pros and cons both to a consolidated or a combined model, as well as a distributed or a separated model of managing training. So experiment, see which one works best for you. Uh, recognize that the lack of a clear answer means that you can find the right one for your own training situation or that of your team. Uh, and then at the daily level, the ideal is separating our strength and our endurance sessions by eight or more hours. Less ideal is all the mitigation strategies that I just covered. So strength first, endurance second, whenever possible, and then making accommodations on our other training to reduce interference and fatigue spillover.